lies in your atonement ministries. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Yet again, we take a different direction this morning. And the reason we take a different direction is because of who God is. We have to understand that sometimes God wants to move in our hearts and on our hearts in a different way. Normally you go to a service and you know exactly what will take place. You know that somebody's going to get up and pray. Somebody's going to get up and sing. You may have a shout and a dance here. And then you'll get the message. Today the Lord says I want to speak. And what God has to say in this moment. And in this season. We've been speaking about. Sowing the seeds. Not looking to reap the harvest. But to sow the seeds. However, in last week's sermon and the week before, we were speaking of conditions of our hearts in which to sow the seed. And the Lord brings a warning to his people. Because in sowing these seeds and not reaping anything, not looking for anything, the Lord says that it's very easy to grow weary. Today's scripture comes out of Galatians, the sixth chapter. the sixth chapter we will go to the fourth verse we'll start at the fourth verse and in that it says but let each one test his own work and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. For one who has taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that also he also reaps. For the one who sows his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. I stop right there. Because the word of the Lord is. In our sowing. In our loving. In our caring for others. In our teaching of others. In our going to see about others. Even in a daily Christian walk where others tend to judge us, it is very easy to grow weary. What is weariness? Weariness comes from a root word called wear, which means that something over time diminishes. 
Something over time breaks down. It means to become tired. But spiritually, it means to become familiar. It means to become familiar in the things of God, which means that you can't do or receive the new because you're accustomed to doing it this way. The tiredness, the wearing, and the breaking down is nothing more than another word that we would call lazy. How easy is it for us to begin to work and do the work and we get tired? So then all of a sudden we look for the shortcut. How easy is it for us to pray? And it's at an uncomfortable time and we become tired. So we cut it short. How easy is it for us to lead and realize that leadership has nothing to do with standing out front. But it's in order to get people to move as one, as a unit under him. And many times leadership requires for us to be the example. Dwayne, why are you talking about leadership? Well, in God, you are the example. You're the peculiar creature. You are strange. Which puts you in an uncomfortable place, which many times will wear you down because of what you see. What's around you. What's taking place constantly, normally. It's very easy to become familiar with your surroundings. And turn around and say, that's God. But what happens in the midst of something when God says, I got to change. Move. Do something different. Well, I do that. I did this and I did that and I, 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 and you've become familiar with you. And you've literally gotten tired of what God was bringing to the table. How is that? I'll give you a perfect example. You're sitting at work or you're sitting in your living quarters with your folks and they're bickering. They're complaining. A couple of them sick. A couple of them just, I'm tired. Well, if the joy of the Lord is my strength and the joy of the Lord comes in more than laughter, if the joy of the Lord comes in more than I can pick this up or I can do this this way. The routine of what they said, the routine of what they're doing, the routine of them speaking something out of the will of God will become familiar to us. And it comes to a place where it wears us down and we begin to speak as they speak. We begin to think what they think. Then we begin to do what they do. But if we've been called to sow seed, the scripture said to test your work. The testing of your work has nothing to do with your validation of what you're doing. Because another example of weariness or how to become weary is a measure of what you're unwilling to do. Easiest point in case in that would be 
You've been doing this, O oh Lord. I've been doing that, O oh Lord. I had this to take place, O oh Lord. I'm tired of waiting on that, O oh Lord. But who's to say that that time frame or those deeds that you're sowing, when you take away the credit and the value of what it is spiritually, the scripture said that you're reaping to yourself, to your flesh, which brings about corruption. So many times the weariness in our spirits says that we have to place a value on what we do according to the glory of God. The value has to be placed in a place that's above us. Because our expectation is no longer limited to me. Eh, you're making sense, preacher, but you're not. Well, let me take you to the Word. I'm going to give you an example. Turn to Exodus, the 17th chapter. In giving you a little history of this, this is um, a particular famous story of Moses after they've come out of Egypt. And Moses has been dealing with some pretty negative folk. Got to realize these are his people. And they've become familiar with Moses. They've gotten to a place where they've now set an expectation of Moses to where, in essence, Moses really is their only representation of God. There's an old saying that the only Jesus or the only God somebody may see may be the Jesus or the God in you. Well, we're talking about the people of Israel that watched Moses hold a rod out and clear a path in the Red Sea. We're talking about the same folks of Israel that didn't have no food to eat, and Moses prayed unto God and said, Lord, they're bickering, they're trying to kill me, they don't like me no more, they ain't going to follow me. And the Lord lets bread fall from heaven so that they may eat in the wilderness. In this particular scripture, at the beginning of chapter 17, they go into a wilderness called sin. Not the sin that we look at as the bad part of life, but they're in a wilderness that was dedicated unto a false god. Sitting on the opposite side of Mount Sinai, and they got to pass through a little passageway in the mountainous region. They don't have no water. This is desert land. And the Lord tells Moses, okay, take that same staff that we cracked the river with and let's tap the rock. Let's give them some water. Well, he does such. Now they got to proceed going forward. The difference being, in order to pass through this passageway, he has to stagger his people in legions or divisions. Because the, the passageway is too small for them to go through. Well, the problem with that is there are little people in this little wilderness called Sin by the name of the Amalekites. We're going to do a little history. We've got to go through the history. We've got to know what's going on. Because if you don't know the history, you're bound to repeat it. Okay? So if we're dealing with the Amalekites, The Amalekites were a people. Ain't nobody. The Amalekites were a people that originated from the descendants of Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And what's funny about these Amalekites were the Amalekites were of the lineage of Esau. Basically, Esau had a son, and his son had a son by the name of Amalek, 
where the descendants of the Amalekites originated. Well, what does that have to do with this passage called sin? Or this wilderness called sin that they're in? It's a dry place. It's a prophetic symbol of where some people may be spiritually. When you have a need for something, you draw or grow weary. When you're yearning for something or longing for something that does not come, you grow weary. Well, the funny part about the weariness of the Amalekites were they were weary because they thought or they were upset with a particular action that Jacob took against Esau way, 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 way back in the day where Jacob actually stole Esau's birthright. The birthright was nothing more than a promise of prosperity, of riches, of an easier life. It was almost like a salvation right. Well, Jacob, Esau, they, they worked their differences out, supposedly. Well, the problem in that is, if Esau never confronted the fact that he gave away the right, there's a root of bitterness sitting there. There's a longing for that birthright. There's a scripture in Deuteronomy 5 that says that you are to teach the children the ways of God. It is the first commandment. Love thy God with all thine heart, your mind, your body, and your soul. Teach them the ways in which they should go. If you fail to do so, a curse shall fall upon them that shall hit the third or fourth generation. That's normally the grandkids. Wait a minute. Esau had a kid, and Esau's kid was named Amalek, who birthed out a nation called the Amalekites. The third generation was now cursed. The fourth generation is now breeding this curse. Well, if we pay attention so what happened with Jacob in this issue? Jacob got the birthright. He wrestled with God, and God changed his name to Israel, which was the nation that was birthed out of Jacob. So now you have Israel and the Amalekites fighting. Wait a minute. Jacob and Esau. Still. In the wilderness of sin. Because Esau went about his way, never following the ways of God. He was worn down, weary, beaten, battered, and bruised, pressing to figure out how to come about the promise. Though the promise was still there to, and available to him, but the choice was to sow into himself. Now that we have the backdrop of history here, Jacob and Esau, Israel and the Amalekites, they're in this wilderness called sin, the very place that Esau took off in the God in which he began to worship, a moon god of Mesopotamia, or yet another Baal. They're in this place, and because they're staggered in divisions to pass through this particular mountainous passage, the Amalekites said, you know what? We don't beat you up from the front because we don't want to confront you. Weariness always catches you from behind. It sneaks up on you, nips at your heels. Because it's not something that's going to show its ugly head right away. It grows. Kind of like when you get mad at somebody. The first time you're mad, it's kind of cool. You can walk away. But if you don't forgive it, you come back the next time and it's a little bit bigger. 
You ain't forgive it, so you come back the next time and it's a little bit bigger. This is what the Amalekites were doing to Israel. I'm going to nip at their heels and I'm going to get them a little more and a little more and a little more and a little more. So after a little bit of time, you start seeing carnage. This is what weariness does because you're tired. You're doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. As the Israelites were doing, bickering under God, we ain't got enough. You need to do some more. You got to have this. But it's only because this is the way that they become familiar with God. See, everybody has gotten familiar with the Lord God, thy provider. Yes, he is. But he's more than that. But the God of, that they were worshiping was the God of Moses that provided. Period. So he better do what I need him to do. When he going to do it, how he going to do it right now? If not, we're going to kill the person that, that's leading, that's hearing from him. This is the reason why we have so many different religions, because everybody's looking at God the provider and have grown weary in the promise, just like Esau, just like the Amalekites, and began to stamp a different name on God. So as we go to Exodus, the 17th chapter, let us start at the 8th verse. It says, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek. While Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up on top of the hill, Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. Whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and put under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. What does that have to do with what I'm talking about? If we pay attention to a key word in here, Moses, the leader, the different one, the one that they saw God in, no longer took the forefront. He called upon another and put a little confidence in him. See, kingdom says the leader ain't got to do it himself because he's not God. If the leader's always out front, then who do they see as God? If the leader is always out front, he then becomes tired. He then becomes lazy. He then becomes familiar because of what everybody else was doing. See, in this particular ministry, the Lord was telling us to sow seeds for a reason. Because as we begin to sow these seeds in the spirit, he's going to tell you to come out front. He's going to bring you out from them. He's going to separate you and Amalek. There really was no difference because we're talking about Jacob and Esau. Same day. Same folks. Family. The difference being the family believed in one thing, but God said another. We're talking about Jacob, Israel. We ain't talking about this righteous dude. We're talking about Jacob, the snake. Jacob, the liar. Jacob, the deceiver. Because when God sat back and had him to confront Esau, he came bearing gifts, not a confrontation to say, you know what, I'm sorry. 
snake. We're not talking about no goody two shoes type of dude. We're talking about that grimy cat. The guy that'll slit your neck in a heartbeat to get what he needs to get. We're talking about the same guy that tried to deceive Laban and got tricked and had to go marry both his daughters because he was in the wrong. He was sowing into the flesh, so he had to reap what was in the flesh. Corruption. We're talking about Jacob and Esau. Let me know, Dwayne, you was talking about Israel and Amalek. No, we're still talking about Israel, Jacob, Amalek, Esau. Family fighting. But what are they fighting for? They're both fighting over a promise. And both of them have grown weary. The people of Israel say, God gave us a promised land that we ain't got to yet. The Amalekites are talking about they stole my promise. They got something that I ain't got. But what's funny is, both sides are weary. Looking for the same thing. People of God, and those that ain't quite following them but know about them. We're talking about the same people. The difference being, how is it that the people, or the men of God, or the women of God, can minister to these folks to get them to understand that they do have a promise. But it's bigger than the Lord God, my provider. God had to set a precedent, do something different, flow in a different way. Where normally Moses, hey, let the seas part. Let the water not be bitter no more. God said, come on to the background, Moses. I need you to step back. Because they need to see themselves. They need to understand that they're warring with each other. We're not talking about the principle of the war. We're just talking about the fact that Moses is standing on the hill, and guess what he's looking at? His family. He's looking at his people. The difference being... We've now distinguished in a familiarity with God. These my folks and who are they? We call warfare warfare because we're warring against not flesh and blood, but spirits and principalities that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. But somehow, some way, we're warring against people because it's the familiar thing to do. We see people as our enemies. But in this particular battle, God was trying to show them, hey, not only am I your provider, but I'm your protection. See, the other part of weariness is, weariness is when you're doing it with your hands. When it's your own strength. Moses was sitting there holding the staff up and Aaron and her are trying to hold his horns up because guess what? As long as Moses did it in his own strength, we talking about a guy that's looking at these people that don't really like him. Two, three weeks ago, they was trying to kill him. We talk about a man that ain't hard for him to become bitter towards the very people he's supposed to love. Yet alone, leave. We talk about a man that's used to being out front, and all of a sudden the instruction of God is put the young one out there. I don't need you to be out there right now. But this is how we always do it. This is how it's done. God saying, okay. Have it your way. Do it in your strength. Let's see what happens. Moses is obedient, he goes up on the hill and he's doing his thing, but over a period of time, he's doing his thing. It became familiar, it became routine. How many times in our lives have we done something over a period of time where our intentions started out great? They started out for God. 
But when we sit in there in a, in, a, in a posture of surrender, looking stupid to the world, looking stupid to our brother and our sister, Psh, oh, I'm tired. I'm going to go sit down somewhere. I'm tired of doing this. I'm tired of talking to them. Lord, I know I've been doing right, but I'm tired of it. It's so much easier to take a turn and do something that makes me feel good. It's so much easier to do something that don't require as much work. That don't require some responsibility. I'm tired. Not to mention, you've been doing it this way forever. Don't grow weary in well-doing. How do you know that you're doing something well? That it's something of God? Moses is sitting there and he's wondering to himself, we went in the battle. Okay, God always do this. This is the way he moves. And all of a sudden his hands drop and his people getting their butt whooped. He can't hold his hands up no more because he ain't got no strength. Because for real, this is how he does things. I've been praying this certain way, and this is how he moved. I've been doing this thing, and I've seen the result. This is how he moves. This formula works. All of a sudden, that formula ain't working no more. You ain't at the front. And every time you do it in your strength, it messes up. It goes wrong. Something just can't go right. The Lord is warning us in this moment because there are going to be some things that seem like they just ain't going to go right. Every time I get happy, something comes to knock me off my horse. Every time I pray and I see a result, it go three steps back. Every time I talk to somebody, it seemed like they got it, but they missed it. Every time I get an advancement in something, I end up going backwards. Could it be that the Lord is telling you, you've been out front too long? Could it be that the Lord is trying to show you in this moment that I, the Lord God, am your banner? I am your protection. Where you've been, come on, let's get it. And you've been handling your business till you worn out. You've been getting. You dancing with the best of them and you laying haymakers. But when you get a little worn out, when you get a little tired, when you get a little weary, when you get familiar with the way that it comes, See, what's funny is the devil is like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can prey upon. He ain't coming the same way. So God got to protect you in different ways. And if God is going to protect you in different ways, we now have to become sensitive to the Lord thy God who protects us. Lord, bring about my peace. You bring about my joy. You bring about my strength. I can't find it right now. Where is it? I'm getting tired of hearing the same old nonsense. I'm getting tired of seeing the same old nonsense. I'm getting tired of praying the same prayer. The Lord is now telling you, okay, you got to see me differently because you've been seeing God right here. Eye to eye. Toe to toe. But if the Lord thy God is your God and not Amalek. See, what's funny was Moses had been fighting every battle I level, out front. But God told him, I need to elevate you, bro. I need to take you to the next level so that you can see the whole battle. Which means that it's a battle with you to get out the way. Stand up on the hill and hold out 
about to stand. Stand on the hill. See, what's funny is, we're not talking about your normal sins that you're dealing with day to day, hour to hour. Ooh, I shouldn't be looking at them. Ooh, I'm fornicating. Ooh, I'm committing adultery. Ooh, I lied. Ooh, I steal. No, we ain't talking about that no more. Because the Lord said, you grew. But in the process of your growing, did you grow weary? Did you grow familiar with the ABCs of Christianity? Did you grow familiar with your ABCs of relationship? Because in that, you now begin to do the routine stuff. Oh, I ain't singing like that no more, so I'm cool. I got a breakthrough with God. I'm cool. God then provided something for me. He healed my body. He healed my mind. I'm cool. Growing weary in the spirit says that I don't need God like that. Because I know him in this way. See, what's funny is those little bitty ABCs of Christianity, they hit you face to face. You were confronted with those things. What happens when you got to turn around? Like you had to do with the Amaleks or the Amalekites. They hit you from the rear. See, what was funny was, going through the wilderness, God said, I will be a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, leading you. He was out front. So all your spirituality and all your channel, all your energy was channeled that way. Well, they say don't turn back. I ain't going back. No, you don't have to go back. But to be truly delivered, you got to confront what you left behind. See, Jacob left Esau behind without a promise, though it was still guaranteed to him. He's a seed of Abraham. It was there and available to him. Esau didn't believe what God said. How many in your family believe but don't believe what God said? Catch what I said. They believe, but they don't believe what God said. Esau believed, he believed as a child of Abraham that nations would be birthed out of him. But the same promise to Abraham was available to Esau because guess what? It came through his loins. It's kind of like your brother and your sister, they got the same promise that mama got when God said, I, I will never leave you nor forsake you, but for some reason, they don't believe that God is never going to leave them nor forsake them. They only believe that he's going to provide when I'm in desperation. They've grown weary. Kind of funny. The brother of Moses is Aaron. Then you got another brother by the name of her standing behind Moses when he could no longer do it. When he could no longer hold his arms up. We still talking about family here. Because the Lord is literally saying in this season charity starts at home. How can you walk around as a prosperous Christian and your brothers and sisters are headed to hell? Because they've grown weary. Do not be weary in well-doing. You can't be weary in well-doing. Well, I ain't got nothing left. Well, guess what? God will send somebody in the midst of your well-doing when you're in a position of surrender because in your weariness, the only thing you can do is surrender unto the real God of your life. What was funny in all of this was Moses was in a battle with himself on that hill. While his brothers and sisters were down in the valley duking it out.
in that position of exaltation where God has to move you to the background and elevate you. You now have to change your thoughts because in a familiar state, they getting on my darn nerves. They should know better. I'm tired of talking. God put you in the seat of Moses and said, don't be weary in well-doing. Well, Moses is tired of standing. He got his arms up. They try to hold him up. And he's like, oh, man, my arms are giving out, but now my legs are giving out. And they turned around and told Moses, come on, let me put you on a rock. A rock that's higher than that. Wait a minute. What is this rock? This rock that we're talking about in common terms is Jesus. Because if you sow into the flesh, only corruption can take place. So if Moses was able to stand in the process of it, Moses gets the glory. So as you're sitting back and you're ministering, and you're pouring out your life to them, your testimony, and they ain't hearing you. But you're doing it because you want to. You're doing it because it just seemed right. What if God just wanted to come in a totally different direction? See, he's glorified in our sufferings. How can he truly be glorified in our sufferings if indeed we don't get to a place where we're broken down? That's why you're going through what you're going through. That's why in the next season, you'll see what you're seeing because no, the Lord really want to tell you you looking at me right here on your level. I'm the real leader. I need you to fall back. All you got to do is go out there and plant the flag. What's funny, after the battle was over, Moses sat back and built an altar unto God. Joe and Isi, the hand of God has touched us. The Lord God is my banner. It means God is my protection. I had no problem falling back because I could see the hand of God. How can you give a testimony of what God is really doing if it's always about me? Always about you or you. people see the hand of God if indeed you never grab them and say, hey, you tired? Come on back. Let me put you on the Jesus. Let me hold your hands up because for real, you're in a place of surrender. Let me show you how to surrender. See, in the scripture, if you go one verse down, it told, God told Joshua to tell the story to Joshua. Why? Well, Joshua was in battle. He didn't get a chance to see this. You remember Deuteronomy 5? We were just talking about. The curse was broken right there when the story was told. Because you're supposed to teach them of God. So many times we're so busy doing out front so everybody can see how God done blessed us. See, everybody knew about how God had blessed the Israelites. How he delivered the Israelites. But nobody had a fear of God. Nobody had a reverence for God or a respect for God. They wanted what God was giving. What happens when that giving is protection? Protection from the rear. See, can't nobody hit you from the back when your spiritual power rests there.
God covers me on all sides. But all I'm looking for is what's coming. God wants to take away what was behind me. He wants to wipe out what was behind me. If you don't believe that, prophetically, turn to Deuteronomy, the 25th chapter. Do, 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 do. Deuteronomy 25, 17. Say amen when you got it. Amen. It says, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt. How he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail. Those who were lagging behind you and he did not and did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not Forget. In this particular scripture, remember what Amalek did to you. And this is something that you got to remember and take personally now. Remember what your past did to you. Remember what you have been running from all your life has done to you. The Lord that God has called for a confrontation in your seed sowing now. Not of the land that you've already inherited, but that of which you left. Amalek was on your tail, cutting you off. Meaning he was kicking you in your butt because you've been running from him. Just like hey, Jacob was running from Esau. Them same folks that you've been supposed to ministry, be ministering to and show them the promises of God and show them where you're headed, you've been running from them. And they've been cutting your tail off. Boom! And you ain't seen them. And you don't want to see them. But if you remember what the Lord thy God did. He made you confront Amalek. And in confronting Amalek. You now can walk in the promise. Not worried about what was coming up behind you. Because it's gone. And what's funny is. You now have a testimony. Not of how you did something, but of how God did something. You now have a testimony of what used to be and the promise of what is. So therefore, you don't have to leave Esau, oh Jacob, where he was. Come on with me. Because you now taking a different place in this. Because you had to let Jacob go out front. But your job, I mean Joshua, your old job in this was, I'm praying for Joshua. The new warrior. The one that's going to lead in the promise. You ain't in the forefront. Oh, shut up. Get your butt in the back. Get weary. Get your butt in a different place than out on the front line. You don't war with flesh and blood. So instead of duking it out with these various things or these various voices that are speaking, step back. We're not talking about your regular average 
average, ordinary type of deal. We're now dealing in a realm of principalities. They're in a wilderness called sin. The Lord says, grow. Grow in grace. Grow in my joy. Grow in my righteousness. Grow in my confidence in you. Well, the funny part about it is if he gives us nothing more than we can bear, could Moses really hold that position? Or was it really intended for him to have to sit on Jesus? To have to rest on Jesus, the rock, while others held up his horns? Well, I should have the power to do this. Weariness just spoke out your mind. Weariness just fell off your lips. I should be able to do this. Is anything impossible for God? No. If nothing is impossible for God, why are you talking about I? If the Lord thy God is your banner, if he is your protection, why are you still speaking I? Because I is limited. If we're talking about Aaron, her, and Moses together, then it's a we. We being unified can do something. Shut up! We can't do nothing. Because without the rock, who's going to hold Moses up? Without the rock, all three of them would have been weary. So now you got a people walking around trying to hold each other up and look important that have grown weary trying to look like they made it. Trying to look like they distinguished. Trying to look like the Christians. But what does God look like? It's a question for everybody. Don't answer it. That's something to think about. What does God look like? If indeed you're made in the likeness and image of God, when you come up with this image that limits yourself to acting a certain way. It's now time to ask yourself, what does God look like? And then go look in the mirror. And I promise you, once you get in that mirror, you like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But did God look like that? Could God have looked like Moses, so weak, with two people behind him and him sitting on Jesus. Could God have looked like the man on the cross by the name of Jesus? Could God have looked like Peter hung upside down on the cross? These are things we got to begin to look at. Because in the midst of the suffering, he's glorified. In the midst of your weariness, he's glorified. When you grow faint, he's the one that makes you strong. So how is it that we keep growing weary? How is it that the devil keep beating us across the back when we know the keys? When we know the signs? When we know the indicators? Wait a minute. When we know what it looks like. Think about it. Prosperity is having the house and the car and all the money and the jewels and the flash and the clothes. Is that what Jesus looked like? Kind of funny that when Peter and James and John and all of them were out ministry, they never went without a need. They always had more than enough. But they weren't rich men. But they were rich in him. Kind of funny that you sit back and you trip off of Moses 
And the pictures and, are the examples of how they portrayed him. Moses looked like a dirty dude. Jesus looked like a dirty dude. But you got all these clean, well-dressed, to the hip type folk. Looking strong in your face. But when it's their time to fall back and get the help, can they really receive the help? Because if they're not in this position, if you notice, I'm sitting, I'm on the rock. If they're not in this position, they're weary. And the same way the Amalekites were kicking them in their butts, they confronting something from back there. This is a battle that we continuously fight in order to blot it from our memories. Forgiveness is a very big part of weariness. It wears on you. It wears on you because you keep remembering why that had happened. What I'm going to do when it happens again. The original sin of Jacob and Esau had nothing to do with the stealing of the birthright. There was never an interaction of forgiveness. That's why the Amalekites or Amalek kept fighting Israel. If you go and you do your history of Amalek, they get inhabited by the Assyrians. Wait a minute, the Assyrians go and they attack the Israelites again right before Jesus comes about and then God delivers their hand again into the Romans who have swallowed up the Assyrians. Constantly fighting Amalek. Constantly. Even to this day in the geography the Assyrians or the Iraqis in Syria, which hates Israel. They still fighting over birthright. Yet to forgive anybody. But they'll tell you they serve God. So when you go into that place with your folks, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, your relatives, and you know that they know God, watch to see whether or not you see the pride that validates the fact that they didn't forgive in their lives. Whether or not they really still fight Amalek or not. Because God validated a whole new promise to those who are following him, who hold him first. As the Lord God thy banner, the Lord God thy protection. See, this promise that we've been talking about the whole time, it's only evolving into something bigger. We've got past that gimme, gimme, gimme stage, oh God. We're now in a place where you've grown up to the fact that somebody's going to need to see you. Well, how can I get in front of these folks if they're going to cut me off? How can I talk to these people if they really ain't trying to hear me? How can I pray with these people when they don't believe what I believe? How can I give them the God that I love when they don't love God? It's nothing more than what was taking place in the valley right in front of Moses' eyes. My family fighting over the promise. We're all God's creation. We're all God's creatures. We're all sons of God. And everybody has that promise available to them if they would believe. You can't force nobody to believe. But you sure can surrender yourself. You sure can get past the breaking down of where you are because the battle is in the spiritual realm to wear you down 
so that you change sides. Well, now Joshua and the Israelites didn't change sides. But if you remember in, in Numbers, the 25th chapter, it said that the attack was on those who didn't believe. It's on the very ones that you're trying to bring out the pit. It's the ones you're trying to bring out of transgression. It's the ones that are sitting back, still fighting with elementary sin. I got to get past my adultery. I got to get past my lying. I got to get past my cheat. I got to get past my stealing. I got to get past my lust. But now it's second nature to you because you grew. You're bigger than that now. That thing just can't come kick you and knock your fruit off. Got a little whiff in you because you're growing in the promise. Your roots are going deeper. So you just can't be pulled straight up out the ground and thrown to die. There was a point in your life where somebody could tell you something bad about you you believe that thing, and you would really want to go and die. But God got a hold of you, and guess what? He didn't grab you from here. He grabbed you from here. God got down on the ground, reached down and pulled you, and said, grow. He watered you. He nurtured you. He gave you life so that you can grow. Like Moses did. He got up on his head. Moses is an old man by this time. He ain't no young sprout. But he didn't grow to a place where he could kind of step back and be of help. See, when you're on the front line, it's all about you. You can step back. It's not about them. See, when you fight in that same battle over and over and over again that makes you weary, it's because you're still on the front line. you still fighting the you battle. It might be praying for them, but it's still about you. That's why it says don't be weary and well-doing. When you sow the seed of flesh, you sow corruption. When you sow a flesh, I mean, when you sow a spirit, spirit says, I step back. I'm not a higher place. I'm growing in grace, so God says, I can seat you in heavenly places. I can pull you up out the valley so you don't have to be down there talking about, get up off me, devil. Get up off me, devil. Get up off me, devil. Eventually, you're going to get tired. Your arms going to get weak. Legs going to give out on you. Feet going to start hurting. Armor going to get heavy. But God got a battle plan where he's literally just saying, all right, man, traditionally, I got to get on my knees and pray. Is that where Moses was at? <laughs> when Jesus was pouring them sins on the cross, was that where he was at? See, weariness says, traditionally, this is the way it got to go. And that's what makes you weary. That's what makes you miss. Because tradition says, I'm back on the front line. Familiarity says, I'm on the front line. It's about me. So I end with this point. And I want you to catch this very, very, very well. If God is saying, don't be weary in well-doing, our prayer needs to become, Lord, give us the different directions of what well-doing really is. Give me the direction to stand out of your way.
It becomes a place where you say, Lord, show me what hill I need to stand on. So that your glory can stand in front of me. Many will tell you it's about your faith. It's about your faith. It's about your expectation. Yeah, those are real good points. But if you go to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and look at the very last verse, it says, I may have faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of those things is love. The greatest of those things is love. If the greatest of those things is love, there has to be a love of the direction of God. There has to be a love for the winds of change in God. There has to be a love totally for God. So many times where that hope, that faith, and that love that many people look at in that scripture, they see themselves. two commandments that mean anything and that are the first two to love thy God with all of thine heart thy mind and your soul and to love thy neighbor as you love thyself you will become weary when you're in that battle between do I love myself more or do I love it's now a recognition point where you know whether or not it's about you or is this about God. Am I worried about what my protection is in this? Whether or not I'm going to look crazy, whether or not I'm going to be out there butt naked. Hmm. Or is God the one covering me? Is God the one that's standing out in front of me? Is God the one that went in there first? Because if you went in there first, I promise you, Amalek going to kick you dead in the butt. This is now the season where you must make a determination in your mind and in your heart for how you love God. And in that examination, Sometimes we got to pray to God, Lord, can you really show me the desires of my heart and how they conflict with your will? It ain't going to be pretty. Because some of the things that we're praying for, God is allowing because he's trying to get somebody to move out of their place. But we're trying to keep them from having to endure it. We're trying to keep them from encountering the wilderness of sin where Amalek was kicking them in their butt. Instead of praying, Lord, make this an easier transition. Lord, send them a Moses to be an example. Lord, send them somebody that's going to bring a word of instruction. Lord, if I can be a vessel of instruction, give me the word. But instead, we pray in the circumstance away. Lord, they struggling and they having this issue and yada, 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 woody, woody, woody. It's the will of God. How can you see where your heart is with God until you hit a place of weariness? 
How can you learn from the mistake? Until you make it. How can you really see geographically where you are if you're sitting in the valley and you stay in the low point? You got to hit a peak and a mountain in your life in order to see where you came from and where you're going. Lord, if it's your will, let me be the one up, set up on the hill so I can have a word. So I can have a prayer. So that I may be able to intercede and surrender. For one who wants to be a warrior. For one who's sitting in the midst of battle. For one who's running from the territory that they've yet to conquer. You overcome by the testimony of the saints, meaning you have to conquer something. Until you conquered on your conquest, all you're doing is traveling around the mountain. You're just like the Israelites were for 40 years because they never conquered what they left. So they just sit there and they come around the mountain and they come 40 years bickering and complaining and complaining and bickering and needing more leadership and different leadership and running from this place to that place to that place to this place with no direction. And they got worn out. So no longer did they have love. No longer did they have hope. And they couldn't possibly have faith. So the devil did his job all through the weapon of weariness all through the weapon of their mind all through the weapon of their own internal desire so father in the name of Jesus we bless you we bless you for a word of warning we bless you for a word that pierces our hearts. We bless you for a word that you will allow to saturate our lives. To saturate our situations. To saturate our desires. So that no longer shall we bear or walk in or will to be in weariness. That we go and pluck the root right now in the name of Jesus. We go get the thing now before it grows. We go get the thing now. Understanding that Amalek can't get us from behind because you are our banner. Because you are our protection. Because you are revealing yourself unto us in a different way. Though sometimes we may not know the direction, oh God, we ask that you give us The words, the prayers, and even the desires to slide back, to fall back in a formation that you've designed for our victory, that you've designed for our winning, that you have designed for others to be delivered. Father, we know that being that, that normal and familiar path has been a great thing and that over time and over generations and seasons, we've seen it work. But Lord, we no longer lend our ears or our hearts to dead things that have been reaped into the hearts of men. But we come to grasp what you brought forth in the spirit realm. We come to grasp what you're producing in us, oh God. And we speak and declare right now that it is good fruit. We speak and declare right now that the seed being sown shall grow into more and more and more because you are a God of multiplicity. You are a God of exponential. You are a God of the possible. Many say nothing is impossible for you, but you are a God of the possible. 
possible because there is everything possible to him that believes. So we speak right now into the lives of your people to breathe more love. Poor old God. Pour out love from places that they've never tapped into before. Pour out love from places that they thought they could never have it. Pour out love from on high, oh God. And give them the different vision of it so that hope and faith will manifest through the fertilization of your love. That hope and faith may be able to breathe in your love. That the words spoken, that the actions that are submitted unto will be bred in your love. That even the very direction that may be, may be distasteful to us will be accepted in your love. That the hard thing for us in confrontation will be accepted in your love. Father, we bow at your feet. We sit upon the rock in surrender, asking for your heavenly host to hold our arms up in the midst of a weary time, in the midst of decision, or even indecision. In the midst of a time where we have worry about what we look like or what we will sound like or what it may feel like. But God, we declare right now unto you that we love you more than ourselves. So we shall surrender. We shall fall back. We shall give you the fruits. Sowing. Spiritually, we shall give you the fruits of our labor, sowing so that kingdom may grow. We shall give you the fruits, O oh God, with the hope and the faith that your love shall manifest according to our wills, according to our desires. But we know, O oh God, nothing will be done outside of your will. We know nothing shall be done outside of your way. So we pray right now, Lord, that you align our love with your love. So that no longer shall we be at war. Sowing into the carnage of others. But while we're at war, we actually bring about peace. That we would have peace as we slide back ministering unto you in your spirit ministering unto you in your manifestations ministering unto you in your love Father we call upon you to move in this situation to move upon our minds to move upon our hearts to move upon our finances to move in our homes so that family shall no longer be separate. So that as we stagger, the Amalekites won't come up in the back end because they believe what we believe, because we believe what you believe, oh God. Father, touch us so that we are not weary in well-doing. That we don't speak a word of death, thinking that we are doing good. That we don't pray a prayer of death, thinking that we are doing good. That we don't walk in agreement with those that are thinking death, because it seems good. in your love, not our situations, not our emotions, but in your love.
Touch in this moment, oh God. Touch in this moment. Because Jesus is interceding for us and we are trying to intercede on our own behalf. We've been fighting a war that we have no business fighting. But you just called us to confront. So today we declare that you are the Lord thy God, our banner, our protection, that the hand of God rests upon us. We build an altar in our heart now. Right now. And on this altar, oh God, we place our worries. On this altar, oh God, we place our doubts. On this altar, oh Jesus, we place our desires. We place our emotions. We place our fears. We place our circumstances. For we know if God be for us, who be against us? So we place these things out here, stripping ourselves of this clothing and falling naked before this altar. For we give you power to be our God. We give you authority to be our God. We give you permission to be our God. And no longer shall we be tired and weary, worn and tattered in this thought. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lastly, I'm going to release a word that God gave me for the city. It is directly in line with that message. And this is a word that will give you instructions so that you know not to fall by the wayside in agreement. Here in the next few months, you will begin to see tragedies within the city. You will literally begin to see brother versus brother, race versus race, fighting one another. And they're wearing each other out to the point of frustration where there must be war. This is the reason why the Lord was saying continue to sow. But don't reap the harvest. You just sow and sow and sow. Because what you're sowing in this, in this time frame is spiritually. Spiritually, that leaders may face their Amalek. Their races will face their Amalek. The Lord gave me Isaiah, the 11th chapter, 1 through 10, and it speaks about the root of Jesse coming up, even though they cut off the tree. They chopped the tree down. The root of Jesse is actually Jesus, but it's also of David. God promised David that there would be a king on the throne as long as the promise existed. That king turns out to be Jesus. The problem being the devil thought he cut Jesus off by killing him. But that root springs up because once you cut a tree down, it will begin to grow back if you don't deroot it. It was not derooted. So therefore, as this root begins to grow back, or this tree begins to grow back, there's a peace that falls upon the land. Where the wolf and the lamb can dwell in the same field. Where the bear and the cow can dwell in the same place. Where a child can sit over a snake pit and not be bitten. Uncommon. Natural history or the order of nature says there's no way. There was no way that they were supposed to cross the Red Sea. 
There was no way that they were supposed to cross the river Jordan. There was no way they were supposed to beat the Canaanites. There was no way they were supposed to beat the Amalekites. There was no way they were supposed to be delivered from the hand of Assyria. There was no way that the temple was supposed to be built three times. There was no way in the world Jesus was supposed to come out of that tomb. The difference being, as we fall back and begin to sow spiritually, instead of trying to fight the foot war, that those that don't quite understand or believe what you believe are fighting, that will be the harvest of peace that you will reap. The whole key in this is the wolf and the lamb being in that same place, they had to confront one. The bear and the cow had to confront one another to be there. The baby and the snake had to confront in order to be there. To dwell in peace. The funny part about war is we have this picture of war being somebody winning. But when we come out of that place of duking it out and becoming worn out, because all the war is is a war of attrition. Whoever lasts the longest is going to win. Not in the world of Jesus. Not in the kingdom of heaven. So therefore, if this is what we believe, when we see something or hear something that says you're losing, you cannot be phased by it. Because of that hope, that faith, and that love that you hold in God, thy banner, God, thy protection. And what you'll see is, you will then become the remnant, as that particular scripture says. A remnant shall be left behind, so that they will understand the root. You will then become the remnant. So for what is normal to most, Becomes abnormal because the remnant, the ring around the bathtub after you then took a bath, the evidence that something was there, the evidence that Jesus is here will bring peace. The whole key is if you stand out front, you're really the one cleaning the tub out, wiping away what Jesus left behind. Just know, when the report of the Lord comes, you know it because it agrees with your spirit. It agrees with your love, your first love. And when the report of the enemy comes, you'll know it right off because the sheep What's funny is you being the remnant, that tree. Remember, he said, just like a, like a tree grow. Didn't even know that this was a, this was sitting somewhere else. As he's allowing you to grow, you're sitting in the middle of the two. That's how they have peace. Because they eat. different today. He had a whole lot on my heart. Um, were there any questions, concerns, comments? Anybody get something different? Anybody see something? I saw this. I'm going to place all my worries at the altar. 
and I saw that there is a war. This, and I saw that I have to just stand still and straight as a tree. I saw that I had to let God do his work, and I do God's work through him. I mean, you know, my, his work through me. Mm -hmm. That's what I saw. And I hope everybody else may have saw something or what I said or something different or saw something in this sermon. I got Tuesday. The Lord said, I ain't the only one that's going to be preaching in this church. Because as you leave from this place, there's now a responsibility on you. Spirit pulls on you to dig deeper. There'll be words that'll be birthed out of you all's feelings. There'll be different expectations and different manifestations of faith that'll be birthed from you all. Good Lord! <laughs> and in the process of that, That's the reason why this ministry will be a traveling ministry. The Lord literally showed me on more than one occasion where though we were supposed to have service here, we had field trips in other churches. We just went as a congregation to somebody else's church. We're not invited, but we're sent there to be an instrument of the Lord, to usher in his presence where they couldn't see him, where they couldn't feel him, where they didn't want him. And it's in those particular places revelation within the word we'll begin to see God in our own lives so that those empty places, those places of Amalek that we've abandoned and tried to leave behind without confronting we will have peace in them so that the predator Strangely enough, you'll end up back in the Catholic Church before long. I will. Is that will? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I don't know when, but you will. Mm -hmm. And in the process of that, there will be an assignment. It's not for you to stay, but there will be an assignment. Because the kingdom is not in these four walls. How can you get to the top of the hill as Moses did? If you're still sitting in the valley. Trying to get it personally to learn. There's a wider scope. Right now, you're still on a smaller level. You still got to bite off what you can chew. You know, you're getting your daily map. But there will come a time where it's in you to a place where it got to come out. And God's going to afford an opportunity. Don't make sense for us to continue teaching each other and don't nobody else know. So that's kind of where God is and I've just been noticing God's still working within the realm of promise. You know, we started out this ministry on the promise, things that kill the promise. Weariness is one of those things and it's kind of funny if you go back to your notes. Those seven enemies of the promise Malachites were there to depress you. We 
He's talking about seven enemies of the promise still. Not even realizing that's what God was still dealing with. Because until we understand our promise and understand it as a whole thing, instead of partial pieces of it, we're going to walk like we just got a piece of it. We'll operate like we got a piece of it. We'll pray like we got a piece of it. So, my job as a pastor is to challenge you. Don't stop at just the scripture you get here. I promise you, you go into your Bible, there's a cross reference. You'll find that that cross reference will take you to something similar, but then it'll make you turn a corner. This particular message today started from a Bible study with Jacob and Esau that I had. And the question was how, was, how was it that Jacob could wrestle with God and God lose? And I told them, I don't serve a God that man can be. So therefore, it got to be something different. Give me a few days and I'll get back to you. And as I began to study that, realized was Jacob was running from Esau. So when the Bible said that he was wrestling with God, he was wrestling with the very image of promise that God placed on him. Jacob was trying to swindle Esau. God was calling for him to confront. Jacob never confronted Esau. What he had to do was confront himself first. The wrestling was all in Jacob's mind. The wrestling was, I am a child of promise. I got to do this with my own hands. That very thing was inherited down to the nation of Israel. They were the people of promise, but they, had, they kept wrestling with it, trying to do it with their own hands. It was a curse. It was something that Jacob never truly At the end of that story, Jacob walked away with a limp. The holy angel of God touched Jacob in the hip to remind him. Think of it this way. You remember the cartoon Tom and Jerry where the angel land on this shoulder and the devil land on this one? And somehow at the end of the day, whatever choice that was made, there was a hindrance right after. That's what I was reminded of. Jacob's wrestling in his mind with good and evil. And at the end of the day, the decision that he made, had he just decided, I'm going to go with God, I'm going to submit to God, there is no injury. But as long as you fight God, how can you possibly win? God told Jacob, let him go. If you don't want this promise, you don't want what I got for you, let me go. I ain't going to fight you. The left was the injury from the bad choice. Again, do I serve a God that's swinging on me and I don't get knocked down? We talking about the same God that just sat back and like 24,000 of them. See you. He killing folks with flip his hand. He's sitting by saying to Moses, you can't look at me in the face because you'll die. How am I going to wrestle with you when you live? Remember we were talking about knowing God as our protection. Knowing God. Well, here's the funny part. As you read that scripture, if you don't pay attention to what the character of God really is, you go along with this teaching that everybody been taught. You hold on to God till you get your blessing. You hold on to God till you get your blessing. You're going to wrestle with God. You're going to wrestle with God. Why? I'm talking about a God of mercy. God that says, I'll do it. Matter of fact, the promise says it's done. All you got to do is believe. I'm going to hold on to you because that's by act of faith. No, it's not. It's an act of doubt because if I got to hold you, 
to know that you're going to get it done. I don't believe you're going to do it. Characteristics of God. Because I love him, I know him. Because I love him, I'm reading his word, and i got to understand every time that there's a word in the word that tells me about God, that's something i got to grab a hold of and stick in my heart. So when somebody gives me something that ain't quite right, it's kind of like you get you got a pitcher of water, and all of a sudden you put some Kool-Aid in it just to make it, make it taste better. How many times has somebody put some Kool-Aid in front of you? I said it was God. It tastes better. No, no, no. Let's be real. The biggest battle in God is you getting past you to get to him. Abraham had Isaac, but he laughed in God's face when God told him that you still don't have a baby. You 80 some odd years old. Ha! Yeah, right. Whatever. God performed his word because he said it. You're not a man that's your life. But Abraham didn't really believe him. That's how Ishmael came about. Character of God. You gotta know the character of God. You gotta follow after the character of God. And you're gonna hear a whole lot of things in this season. It's gonna be Kool Aid. They're gonna sweep it up. They're gonna dress it up. They're gonna make it appealing for you to drink it. But if it ain't living water, living water changes you. Living water, when you walk away, you got questions. You got something to go talk to God about. It ain't just, a, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. And you the same way 24 hours later. No, it's some, Lord, that, mm, that man, that's messing with me. Why? You got to show me something. We talking about a God of manifestation here. If you sowing seeds into him, he got to produce it. Whatever it may be. So in this, going from Jacob and Esau and seeing how that confrontation didn't quite work and then how God sat back and really wasn't wrestling with Jacob. Jacob was really wrestling with his thought of him in God. And then you see uh, Isaiah the 11th chapter, and I'm like, that don't make no sense. I ain't gonna trust my kid at the, at the head of a snake pit. I ain't, if I'm if, if it's me and the dog on field, I ain't gonna sit there with no wolf or no bear. And he's like, if you really at rest with me, you got no choice. Because what you're seeing is I'm sticking you in the middle of a war. But I ain't sticking you there to fight. I'm sticking you there to be at peace. To be my representative. The character of God don't say war. When God stick his hand in it, he brings peace. If you're an enemy of God, I feel for you. But I'm a friend. And he, took, he said it in the scripture. If, he, if you are a friend of God, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. Servants just obey and don't know why. Friends know why. The reason why is to bring peace. Jesus came not to bring peace, but to bring division. Why? Because our idea of peace was going along with what everybody else did. Alright? So that's pretty much it, but if, as, as, I, as I'm showing you, if you see, that, that's a whole lot of twists and turns and we're talking about five different scriptures. We only use three of them today, but all of that started out of Jacob and Esau. Who I said, go, go do the history on them. Where they come from? Why? In the Bible, 
with every name that you see, every city you see, there's a significance to that. So many times we read the story and ain't worried about it. It's the story that counts. Yeah, you know the story. He know the story. It's why it's called history. Why did they fight the Civil War? See, they'll slap a label on it. Civil War was false. We were free slaves. No, it wasn't. Civil War was false because they were fighting to keep the monetary value of what slaves were. It had nothing to do with freeing them. The North was sufficient without slavery. The South was not. It was to bring somebody under submission. But when the leaders are under submission, both sides got to come together. The Malachites walked away, but they were wiped out because they didn't believe in what the leader was saying. They didn't believe in what God was saying. Well, we came up with the Constitution. There's one nation under God. Was it really? Do the history. Go and look at the names. Crispus Atticus, atheist. Thomas Jefferson. John Q. Adams, atheist. George Washington, atheist. Folks don't even understand, Thomas Jefferson was a flat-out devil worshiper. Thomas Jefferson is the author of about five different wicker books. We ain't looked at the history. Go back and look. And, and that's all the Lord is saying because in this season, we don't get tricked by what we hear and by what we see because it's been Kool-Aid for so long. Alright? Go on and read. What you got there, man? You sure? You like church? What you learned? There it is. All you needed to know. I didn't know that at first. You didn't know that? You learn all kinds of things in church. Mm 